Thanks again for joining us. We are going to kick off this really interesting session which affects all of us and how we think about the visual environment, how we think about ourselves, um, and how we think about those around us, those we have yet to meet, those in our own lives, and we're going to look at that all through clothing and we're going to ask ourselves uh, the question, what does clothing communicate? I'm going to go ahead first and introduce uh, to you Diana Njai, who is the Curator and Cultural Heritage Specialist at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage here at the Smithsonian. And she's going to offer a very unique angle uh, on today's topic. In fact, maybe we could even start, Diana, by telling us a little bit about how your own interest in this topic emerged. Okay, well, I started, first of all, hello to everyone. And um, I was always interested in clothes because uh, my my parents, especially my mom, was an incredible dresser. And really early on, one of the things that uh, she would uh, tell us about is, um, you know, what was important about dressing. You know, how you never went out uh, just uh, with your clothes not pressed, or uh, you always went to. Um, church on Sunday wearing a hat and I remember um, having to wear um, really beautiful but scratchy crocheted uh, anklets with my Mary Janes when I was when I was going out in my Sunday best and um, then I got uh, as I got older I just loved the idea of experimenting with clothing and just observing what people wore and uh, wanted to be a fashion designer um, ended up in uh, wanting to learn about the clothes of the world and that's how I uh, became an anthropologist, one of the reasons why I became an anthropologist. Um, but at the same time, I was always curious about um, why people dressed the way they did and what it said about who they were and what they were interested in. And uh, so I guess that's an interest that's continued um, all of my life. We are finding that the people who are joining us today come uh, from all different backgrounds and have uh, varying interests, um, but people uh, on a whole are curious to know about uh, what their own clothing says about them. That's right. Uh, they are curious, I hear, uh, in seeing uh, connections, as Christine puts, uh, between clothing and culture. Um, we have uh, Jyoti who joins us from, I believe, um, Indi uh, from India who's interested to know whether clothing has cultural significance and we have people who are relying on the fact that the first two sessions were great and they expect no less of you. So <laughs> okay. No pressure. No pressure at all. No pressure at all. By the way, this is a picture of you, is it not? That's right. That was during the phase when I was really interested in fashion design and in the back is someone people may not remember. Um, it's a photograph of a model whose name was Twiggy from England and she was uh, the one of the top models at the time and um, I was in a, an apprenticeship pro program uh, in New York and we were learning about how to design our own clothes and how to make our own clothes and uh, so that was um, one of one of the occupational communities that um, I was training for which uh, we're going to talk about when we talk about artisans of style and who the people who support people as they dress. Uh, this is one of the first uh, dresses that I made and it's um, in uh, the place where I grew up in Bermuda uh, which uh, we're, I'm on the steps here and um, I think that when you're thinking about what people wear you, you think about uh, the choices that we make in terms of um, what we wear but also who makes the clothing and, and how does how that clothing becomes part of our wardrobe um, and same goes for here same goes for all the things that we um, have with us and I see that uh, Jade Banks is online she's part of our uh, Jade Banks is in New York City and uh, she is working with a group of interns from Mind Builders and we'll be seeing a few of the photographs that Jade took in her investigations of style with the Mind Builders folks uh, because they're looking at you know African-American style in New York City. 
We've asked people the why question before we get started, mm -hmm. before we talk about the how and the what. People are um, curious as to why it matters, why do we study dress, and some of the answers others are sharing in here um, range from uh, Jade's comment, uh, hi Jade again, uh, preserving traditions through expressive arts, thinking of dress as an expressive art mm -hmm. uh, form. Um, Somebody else uh, talking about that, it, it uh, and this is Beatrice saying, it tells us about our, our beliefs and our feelings, a comment which is uh, echoed by, um, by uh, uh, Mayori as well, who says it tells you a lot about how people feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested, um, Harold in town <laughs> online, and Harold's from Bowie State, and uh, it's another group that we'll be working with is asking about how clothing and the way we dress is a language. How is it a language? Um, and and actually, I want to. Can I throw that out back to the group? Of that course. would be great. You're already getting um, cons questions that put you in the role of consultant. People wanting to know what they should be dressing for certain kinds of consulting or interviews or things like that. Uh, are, are they going to uh, pick up some guidance along the way on that? Well, actually, um, what we're we're today we're not exactly going to talk about. Um, uh, what to wear on special occasions, but I think that the kinds of things that we're studying in this project, the Will to Adorn, have to do with uh, the dress codes. You know, what um, when you go to a job interview, uh, you're entering a specific community of style, and um, we define a community of style as a group of uh, people that share um, a common uh, values around dress and that communicates a an identity that's understood within a group and it's usually learned informally so I guess um, the way in which we learn how to dress appropriately is by um, observing and that's one of the main tools that folklorists use as well to study dress by looking at uh, different places and looking at what people uh, um, generally wear uh, to those places. Um, it may be a workplace or it may be a party or it may be a place of worship and then um, observing um, uh, how people react to the way that uh, folks are, are dressed. For example, um, if you go uh, into a workplace and everybody is wearing a tie, your, your, your first day of work, everybody's wearing a tie and a jacket and you're wearing a t-shirt uh, and your favorite jeans, you sort of get the, the, um, the impression after people have looked at you and talked to you that that might not be the dress code for the place you're working. And uh, that's you're exercising your skills as a researcher in observation there. Um, so, so if we were to, is, is, is that the definition of a community of style? Is that, is that example, would that be a good example? Well, I think that that's, that's one example. And, and uh, community of style um, uh, is a group that, as I mentioned, shared a, shares an identity. And this identity is shared by similar experiences and knowledges and uh, values and ideas about what's pleasing, what's appropriate, and what's beautiful, and uh, and actually, just as we may be we belong to many groups in our lives, including our families, our school buddies, uh, music groups that we belong to, uh, ethnic and cultural groups we belong to, we may belong to many communities of style or many uh, many other kinds of communities. Uh, so that's that's a good example there. Um, Daniel, by the way, wants to know before we leave the for the moment the, the concept of community of style. Is there such a thing as a community of non-style? Ah, that's interesting. Well, um, I guess I would want to ask Daniel. Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, what would be what would be a community of non-style? To to I'll throw it out to the group. What do you mean by that, Daniel? We'll put we'll put Daniel on the spot here for a moment. Yeah. Um, and here's a question uh, as well. How uh, do you see these communities of style being? Are they cross-cultural, or are they more specific to certain cultures? 
Okay, well, these are some of the things that, that we are looking at. And because communities of style um, have to do with shared values and shared experiences, very often they are um, uh, communities that um, depend on other things other than just dress, but um, what people like to do together and um, what are the ways that people uh, think it's important to, uh, to dress. Well, da Daniel elaborates, I mean a community that goes in the opposite direction of communities of style. Hmm. Well, that in itself could be a community of style. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely, Daniel. Like a lot of folks, you know, one of the things that's interesting in the United States and maybe in some other places, and people can fill me in, um, when kids get to be teenagers and are rebelling against what their uh, parents wore, sometimes they will um, adopt styles of dress that are very, very different. They want to be individuals. But that in itself can be a community of non-style. Those folks who are dressing um, in a different way from the rest of, uh, from the way that their parents dress, but are dressing like other youths of their own age uh, dress. Let's ask, we'll come back to artisans of style and exemplars of yeah, style. Yeah, sure. Let's ask one more question and then take a look at perhaps some of the clothing that, that starts to um, be a, a marker, if you will, of some of these of some of these uh, cultural aspects. But let's ask people what kinds of clues to identity are in one's clothing. What um, what are some of the things we can learn about someone from their clothing? Sure. Well, yeah, that's um, actually we have a exercise that that we ask folks about. Um, there are items of clothing sometimes that uh, we think of as cultural markers. And um, I think I hear, I see some. They put through your hair, and then it would straighten your hair. And a lot of people have many, many stories about growing up and getting their hair straightened, especially, um, uh, well, growing up during the 40s, the 50s, uh, and the 60s, it was something that uh, many African Americans did. And I'm going to show you the next, uh, the next comb. Okay, many people recognize that too, which signaled a real change in the way that people uh, manage their hair. And um, it had to do with the birth of African American consciousness and being proud of uh, being African American, being proud of being of African American descent. And I think maybe. Um, folks who are listening in can even see uh, some of the symbols that are on that comb that have to do with the times. But these are both cultural markers, and they're markers of an identity, um, and perhaps people can comment on those identities or think of other objects of their own. Um, Mary Beth has a quick question. Is it still considered style if you choose your clothes for functionality and or comfort? Ah, well that's a that's a good question too. Um, well a style is uh, would have to do with functionality and comfort, but it would also it might also have to do with the colors. There are lots of different ways to dress 
that um, different colors, different uh, cuts of clothing that all have to do with functionality and comfort. Uh, sometimes because as people get older, they think, sometimes they think more about comfort. Um, comfortable shoes, for example, um, are associated with uh, the community, the large community of style having to do with, um, with age um, or with sports or with the occupation you have. So that uh, does come into a community of style. If you're, if you're in the medical profession, for example, and you need to dress, you're, you're uh, in a comfortable style, you're also going to need comfortable shoes. That becomes part of that style. And you can use the chat area to tell us about an article of clothing that you wear or an accessory or a hairstyle that defines who you are. And if you, after you, after you list the, the article or the hairstyle, if you want to describe it, um, tell us how it helps explain your life or your culture. Um, so go ahead and put that in the chat box as well. And let's collect a set of cultural markers, if you will, from the people who are great. with us today. Let's do that. And while they're coming in, maybe you could tell us about this cultural marker and its relevance to you. Okay. Well, uh, when I was growing up, uh, many young girls who were of um, Caribbean descent, uh, you know, from the West Indies, especially from Guyana, Trinidad, um, Jamaica, wore bangles, uh, gold bangles. And uh, this was my gold bangle, and it was given to me by my mom and when folks came to the United States it was a symbol of being Caribbean but originally the bangles were uh, from India from East India and uh, because people um, the style of bangle was from East India and uh, in Guyana at least there were uh, many people from India who encountered uh, folks of African descent and they wore bangles and so that cultural style of wearing bangles uh, was transmitted from one community to the other and became a very important uh, signal of of identity. Uh, it's made of gold and uh, it was a sign of wealth as well. It was a sign um, of uh, having a uh, an ancestry that was from the Caribbean and little girls would get a very little one when they were small and then as you got older you'd get larger ones and then you'd get more so you might have an armful of bangles as you got older and um, I don't know if ever anyone can see th this uh, picture this is a picture of me playing with friends in um, on the island of Bermuda which is a little bit above the Caribbean, but um, I have my bangle on. If you can't see it, I'll point it out for you <laughs> right there. Um, and I'm wondering whether other people uh, who are uh, calling in or writing in have um, bangles or have the experience of wearing bangles and can, can tell us a little bit about uh, how their bangles are uh, marker of cultural identity. Well, we have someone uh, joining us from the de from Denver who says, I wear a bangle exactly like that, but I'm an old man of Caucasian descent. Okay. I'm curious to hear, though, if and what, uh, if it has a significance to you that you could share with us and what you think it says about you or what it says to you about you. Um, we've got an incredible collection of, I uh, this uh, the, wow. the, the chat actually looks like a um, a dream for your research project right. here. Not That's right. Not that you're right. all um, <laughs> subjects in the study here. We had somebody who said that they wear a bikini often, but they're from Brazil, and they suspected that such attire might be not as welcome outside of where they live. That's a that's a very good point. Um, the that the cultures, the style, and dress codes um, are particular to a community. That's one of the ways that we know. That um, that there is a cultural element to dress, and once you go outside of that community, sometimes uh, that becomes something that people don't accept as well. 
and when we go from one place to another, when we travel from one place of, to another, sometimes we have to learn the new dress code. And uh, that in itself is a hint that communities of style exist. Jenny from Decatur wears bangles that her uncles, who uh, who were from India, gave her during childhood. It's a familial tie uh, to his culture that she wears. And we see we have people here from uh, Peru who say that people there wear the clothing of their ancestors uh, as a way to um, uh, s maintain that connection. Women who live in the Andean and in the jungle still use clothes of their ancestors. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you. Yes. Let's um, uh, maybe walk back in time a little and take a look at some of the history of clothing and cultural markers. Sure, sure. And and actually, um, what um, what we started to do, what we started to do um, when we looked at African American dress, we were interested in African American identity and um, the ways that um, within one nation within one country, people that may be considered part of one large cultural group also have very diverse communities um, of style, of, um, of ideology, of worship, of, um, of regional identity, and uh, but overall, just like um, music or jazz or uh, dance, uh, African American style uh, is one of the means of expressive culture. One of the ways that people express who they are. That is that is very important, and that's something that uh, Zora Neale Hurston, um, uh, who many of you know as a writer, who is a folklorist and anthropologist. Uh, uh, talked about that the Wilter Dorn is one of the primary characteristics of African American expressive. It's an important part of expressive culture of African American art. By the way, someone is asking whether makeup counts. Makeup does count. It's part of the arts of the body, definitely. And uh, what um, one of the things that we're looking at in addition to how people dress and we're thinking that we're saying that everyone is a dress artist. Everyone puts together these choices of what they're going to wear, and uh, puts it together um, with the idea that it's expressing an identity, expressing their own identity. But the other thing is that they're artisans of style, and the artisans of style, as I mentioned, are people who support um, the who use their creativity, their special skills, and their knowledge of body arts and adornment to support the needs and desires of their clients who belong to communities of style. And we're looking at a picture of Elizabeth Keckley. Uh, this is from the Library of Congress. And a dress she made, uh, and many of the dresses she's made, um, have been in the National Museum of American History. And artisans of style have been important not only for uh, their mastery of dress styles, but also uh, they have been in very influential positions. Elizabeth Keckley was a confidant to Mary Lincoln, and she um, was uh, very much one of the people who uh, encouraged Mary Lincoln in uh, becoming an abolitionist, in supporting the fight against slavery. But she was a dressmaker, and so we assume that while she was fitting. She was also talking uh, about things that were important to her community. Uh, the same thing with uh, many people don't realize that Rosa Parks was also a dressmaker. Rosa Parks, who was a civil rights activist, and because she um, took a stance uh, to sit on uh, a segregated bus and would not sit in the segregated a uh, part of town really was was thought of as the um, as the mother of the civil rights movement, uh, and so she was also a dressmaker. One of the places where people organized and um, talked about uh, civil rights and politics in 
uh, in addition to the African American church, uh, was also the barber shops and the uh, beauty shop, beauty parlors, where people got, got their hair done, also by artisans of style. And um, the style, um, the the uh, things that we wear uh, and the things that people in African-American communities d reflected many, many different things. They reflected um, class, they reflected uh, where people came from, and they continue to do that. Uh, this is from the YMC, YWCA Camp for Girls from the Addison Skirlock Collection, a collection that's now at the Museum of Natural History. And you can look for clues to what was fashionable at the time um, by looking at these girls and how they're dressed. So the arts of dress and adornment are more than just statements of personal taste and style, as people have been mentioning uh, when they're writing in, but they're also um, visual vocabularies of community and a way to talk about who you are and where you see yourself. And uh, these three photographs were taken by Jade Banks, who's online, and they're very different styles here. Um, but they also uh, reflect uh, what people who come to this uh, Dance Africa uh, are interested in. Head wraps are associated with Africa, and the two women in the middle are wearing head wraps that reflect their pride in, in who they are. This gentleman uh, on the right is wearing a very distinctive style, um, and notice shoes, and uh, he's also what we would call an exemplar of style, somebody who's really mastered those aesthetics of style. But let's go on. Um, uh, we're getting lots of feedback here, I think. <laughs> a tremendous <laughs> amount. Um, but can I ask you, uh, I, I, this is such an interesting question. It combines technology, uh, which of course is the, the format we're using to reach everyone today. Uh -huh. When people are choosing avatars or th th pictures online to represent them, is this also part of your work too in analyzing what that says about them? That's a question that's come in about someone who's created a virtual version of themselves online. Wow, that is a great question. And we haven't been looking at that. We've been looking at uh, uh, people as they actually dress, but that is absolutely wonderful because uh, we make choices as to what we dress, and of course we have a lot more choices as to what we look like as avatars, so uh, maybe we should include that in our study. Thank you very much. Great question. Um, we had a question earlier from a classroom of uh, kids who were um, curious to know um, what it said about them if they chose to wear their pants hanging down. And that might be a good point for us maybe to take a look at your uh, your sort of role play or your case study. That's right. That's right. This is a great entry. Well, there's um, a New York senator, Senator Adams, who uh, is African American and has placed billboards um, all around uh, to complain about just that, wearing your pants uh, below your waist and sometimes even below um, all the way below your waist, exposing your box of shorts. And he described that as a tradition um, that um, really says that kids are identifying with prison inmates um, because um, he feels that the style came out of uh, inmates not, allow not being allowed to wear belts because of prison security. And he says that it supports the stereotype that says that all young um, African American men who wear it or other men are, are emulating or leading um, or um, admiring a criminal lifestyle. Now, what I'd like to um, throw out uh, to folks who are part of this is, uh, you know, what do you what do you think is is um, what is, what do you think is the case? And especially for those of you who choose to wear your uh, pants below the waist, uh, do you think that he's right? Uh, or 
There's an alternative view that it's an expression of um, of style and expression of identity, and, and, and that's it. What's the meaning it holds for you? And so I'll just review those choices here. So how do people in this community of style describe why they dress the way they do and what meaning it holds for them? What do you think? So A, is this is simply a fashion uh, and a reflection of youthful expressive creativity, and it should not be banned. So far, that's the leading answer. The second choice is, well, this is a style learned from inmates in prison, and it encourages young people to identify with a criminal lifestyle, and it should be banned, or none of the above. And let's see what you think other people, um, those who didn't say A or B, what might they have said as their answer? That's what we're asking you on the lower right corner of your screen. They might say, no, this is the way I like to dress because. What do you think? whether you're answering this autobiographically because you fit uh, into this community of style or you're imagining um, what somebody might say. We'd love to hear from you in that chat box on the lower right. Well, it will let me show my personality without having to speak, says one student joining us. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make the little chat box on the right larger for people so you can see more of what's going sure. on over there. Uh, well, it's popular. My friends do it, and I want to copy their style. Uh-huh. It's sort of a club of belonging, KP says, okay. using the clothing. That would be a community of style. Someone else who says it looks good. <laughs> All right. And that's an aesthetic uh, judgment. That's a value. That's what we talk about when we say that we're talking about aesthetics. Um, but, you know, what the um, what everyone is saying is so helpful because... Uh, I wanted to get back to why, uh, how we research clothing. And um, there are many, many different ways to research clothing. And folklorists um, and uh, cultural researchers use several ways to go about this. One is, as I mentioned, observing um, what people are wearing. Another way, and this is what we're doing here, is by asking people about why they dress the way they do. And another question, another way that people study is by um, really asking people to um, talk about their life stories and how uh, their culture um, is reflected themselves in their in their dress, and I guess when we have our virtual exhibit up, we'll be asking people to uh, talk about how their uh, their style reflects their dress, and also what communities they belong to. Diana, can I ask you a quick question before we leave this this New York example here? Sure. Bobby um, from Wisconsin wants to know. Even if the low pants choices originally were copies of prison inmates, would mm -hmm. a young person choosing to dress that way actually understand the historical antecedent for their way of dressing? That's that's a very good question, and uh, this would be one that we would want to know. And the way that we would find out is by asking young people who who dress that way. Well, you know, where did it come from? Where did you learn? Uh, this way of dress, or how did you get the idea to dress this way? So maybe we can look at um, at a few examples. Maybe we can start with okay. this one. Okay. Um, so we're looking at a few examples of communities of style, and communities of style in the African American community. Um, so communities of style can, as I mentioned, be about um, where you live, you you know you look around you and you f you see um, what people are wearing. It can also be um, the affiliations you have, and um, the AKA um, is a Greek organization, a sorority that um, started in the Washington D.C. area, and the AKA sorority has special colors, and I'm sure that people can tell me what those colors are by just looking at what's up on screen. Um, pink and... We're hearing pink and green. Pink and green, of course, of course. And um, 
anyone who has been um, around the campus of uh, a historically uh, black uh, college or university um, at a certain time will see that there are people who are part of sororities and fraternities who use colors to um, distinguish, to, to mark who they are and to mark and to distinguish them from other uh, sororities or fraternities. Uh, there are like Omega, Omega uh, Sci-Fi, founded in 1911, is a fraternity and um, fraternity members wear obviously purple and, <laughs> and yellow, purple and gold. So um, there are two ways to look at dress. Actually, there are the way there you can look at dress. Uh, we say emically from inside, from an insider's view, and we also can observe dress from the outside. And um, the best uh, way to research expressive culture, to research expressive uh, dress in this case, is by a combination of what people from the outside observe and what people from the inside observe. And uh, because dress um, uh, can be looked at as a mark of ethnicity, of entitlement, of status, commitment to a faith, a cause, or an idea, you, um, we are looking in, in our project, which is called The Will to Adorn, um, at what the correlation is between ethnicity, entitlement, uh, affiliation, and the things that people choose to wear. We're also looking at the people who help uh, to make those um, th that clothing. And so we'll go through some, some, uh, some more slides. Ethnicity, this is from, uh, these folks are from uh, originally from Ghana, but from a Ghanaian community in the United States. And uh, this is a slide from the inauguration of a Ghanaian community leader in the United States. And he's wearing clothing that comes from Ghana that reflects his background and that reflects um, what people would be wearing at a similar occasion back home. Uh, uh, this the in terms of religion, uh, there are many ways that people uh, reflect who their beliefs through a particular dress or um, dress code, and so that's another thing that we are looking at. A few moments ago, you uh, mentioned the sort of how of of the research that you do, mm -hmm. and um, I, I know you've you've made the point that it's. Uh, I mean, obviously, the people who are dressed in this photo will not be dressed like this every day, at every moment, every place they go. Right? That's right. That's right. So what we uh, look at um, is where people wear the clothing that they wear, as well as uh, when they wear the clothing that they wear. I'm sure many of you um, uh, will not wear the same thing when you're going to a party as when you're going to, um, let's say, when you're going to work, or you may, <laughs> um, uh, or there may be special occasions um, uh, that you wear special kinds of clothing, uh, holidays, or celebrations, or uh, even going to a concert. Mm. Uh, yesterday, um, I went to the con a concert of the Parliament Funk Funkadelics, and the Parl and some of you may um, know of the music group George Clinton, which was very popular in the United States in the 1970s, and continued and had a particular way of of dress. And each of the band members uh, wore a different dress. George Clinton. Um, um, wore uh, wigs. He, he talked a lot about coming back to the mothership, and uh, there was also um, different characters within the band, uh, Dr. Poo Poo, and um, um, 
I'm sure that other folks will have different memories of this. Uh, and fans came to the concert wearing what they, uh, what the band wore. And they were definitely part of a community of style. Anyone who's ever uh, dressed up for the Rocky Horror Show, which is um, a, a movie and a theater show, which is shown at midnight in some parts of America, um, they dress up as their favorite cast members. In fact, I think that uh, there's some of the people in this room who may have participated in that. <laughs> and... Uh, so these that's also community of style. Uh, the civil rights movement, uh, when people wear t-shirts that um, have either the logos or um, have sayings that relate to their beliefs, that's also um, a culture marker. Those are also things that we observe at a, at a march, but we might not observe it at, um, at another kind of event. So um, all of these places are where we go to study dress. We've had a number, we talked a little bit about this a few moments ago, but we, we certainly have a number of questions that have come in about uh, baggies and skinny jeans and so forth. So this, I think there are a number of people who are interested to hear what you have to say here. That's right. Well, actually, our, our group, uh, uh, Jade uh, Banks and Mind Builders, have been looking at three generations of hip-hop and the transformations of hip-hop and the relationship to the music so that um, uh, I again would like to throw this back out to the to the folks who are listening in but also ask people to observe are there you know as hip-hop which is popular all around the world um, has been such an important music has it influenced the way that people dress not only in the United States, but also in other parts of the world. I should mention, tomorrow we'll be talking uh, uh, with Atesh Sanborn about who owns music. Um, uh -huh. We'll be as one of our sessions tomorrow, and um, I think people will inevitably be linking music uh, to other physical aspects of their life, including dress. So I hope you'll tune in for that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, before we, before we um, get ready to go, I wanted to... Um, talk about the the way that this project, uh, the Will to Adorn, this research project is taking place. And um, in um, some sorts of research, uh, there's one researcher or just a, a team of researchers that go out um, armed with tape recorders and and uh, video cameras and still cameras to, to do res research. Um, on their own. The, the, the thing that I think makes the Will to Adorn question, uh, the Will to Adorn project unique is that we are reaching out to, uh, to people who are themselves dressers, uh, who uh, belong to community of styles within uh, different African American communities, to people who are uh, familiar with communities around the world, as a matter of fact, who have been influenced by African American dress, and uh, we're seeking information and photos on Flickr, and um, we'll be putting up um, online um, our a virtual exhibit hall, and we'll be asking folks to weigh in on uh, some of the issues that we brought up here. We'll have more information. It's a two-year project. Um, and uh, we hope in the end to really have a um, input from all around the, the United States as well as other parts in the world about how uh, African American identity and the diversity of African American identities are communicated through the aesthetics uh, of dress, the arts of the body, including makeup, <laughs> as someone asked about, including uh, different dress styles, um, including body arts. I saw that someone uh, asked about tattooing and um, and other uh, ways that people um, mark their identity through dress. Uh, we'll be looking in Washington, D.C., New York, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands this year with our teams of researchers and in future years in Atlanta, 
uh, Chicago, Detroit, and Los Angeles, but we're also reaching out to you um, as uh, citizen scholars to uh, join to come back to this site. Uh, we're also going to be um, putting some things on another site that um, we'll be asking about mission, we'll have a mission for you to write your own cultural autobiography of dress and um, think about these issues. So um, to sum up, um, you know, what can we, and what can and can't we tell about people from their dress? You know, an awful lot. And, and um, we can use uh, dress as a way to think about and to talk about identity and to talk about um, who we are, what we think about, what our values are, and how we link to other people. And uh, I think that that's uh, what the Wilter Dorn Project is about. Thanks, Diana. We have a number of great questions, and I'd like to take a few of them now. And by sure. the way, um, back to what is meant by contributing to this project, we had a list of cities that you'll be focusing in on, but my understanding is you'll be doing your res uh, your research as well uh, via social media That's and asking right. people to photograph, document, and upload perhaps to a Flickr site and um, uh, to create a sort of a virtual curated exhibit of some of the communities of style in different places. That's right. And, and when we do this, one of the things that we want to think about, which is something that researchers think about, is also uh, that we want to make sure that um, we get uh, permissions from uh, the folks that we photograph, uh, especially if we're loading, if we're we're going to be putting them online, and we'll have some guidelines going into the uh, virtual exhibition hall uh, for uh, qu not only some of the questions to ask and um, some of the things that we would want to uh, make sure that um, we. Uh, get from people before their um, their pictures go public. Great. Um, Here's a, a question, okay. a, a couple. Um, this one's from Deborah, who says, aren't you influenced by what's available to you to purchase? You can't always get what you really want. So people who are treating clothing as a utility, um, something as uh, not as um, necessarily actively choosing, in other words, do you have to consciously be choosing your style um, mm -hmm. for you to be a member of a community of style? Well, yes, I think that what you wear um, depends on what's available for you to wear, but a lot of times people will transform what they wear in subtle ways, like a t-shirt. Uh, you can take a plain white t-shirt and you can wear it in a certain way, even if you wear it inside your pants or outside your pants, you're making a choice there. Um, if you um, choose to wear your sneakers tied or untied, or if you choose to um, wear your, um, your hair in a certain way, of course it depends on what's available and um, what's available to you, and that's what helps to change styles in general, but also you have a choice about how much to wear, how little to wear, within large and small, to large and small degrees. So to different degrees, you uh, what's available is what you wear, but in other ways you can change. Um, Zeb, a high school student in Douglas, Georgia, asks, um, what do you find interesting about the huge necklaces that many young African American males wear today? And we had an earlier question about what the large necklace you're wearing in the photo on the screen says about you. Ah, okay. That's well. Um, I think that the necklaces that um, that you've seen as part of, I believe, hip hop style over the past few years. Um, is again another way that people identify themselves, that people choose to define um, who they are and um, the fact that many different people wear, uh, that, you, that you've seen it on, on musicians, that you've seen it uh, in various communities, uh, 
people um, identify themselves as belonging to a group that likes a particular kind of music um, or that um, that identify with uh, particular musicians um, in a group uh, through those necklaces that people wear. It's a form of self-expression. Um, the necklace that I'm wearing um, uh, has to do with um, my identification as a as an artist. I'm an artist and I made the necklace and and I think that also um, people are able to to choose a lot more uh, from the the things that they make and the things that they uh, they buy or the things that they acquire from others uh, that are personal expressions as well as expressions of group. We have time for one more question, and then we have a, a special announcement, which I'd like to share with you um, from a special guest. Um, this question comes from Michael, who says, Diana, what, what do you think about school uniforms in terms of removing cultural cliques and redirecting student focus on education? It's a big question, of course. That is a big question, and we have to go into the reasons why. Um, uh, you, you mentioned very well the reasons why school uniforms are are uh, seen as being very important. Um, I would say that um, uniforms in themselves really help to promote also a sense of of the group in the school. And it's a very old way of showing uh, showing belonging, so it may have to do with school spirit. Um, I think that what is interesting to me, uh, as a researcher within looking at school uniforms is how again kids can tweak those uniforms to make them their own. We, we've got students joining us from boarding schools and schools that wear uniforms and others um, that do not and we're certainly getting some opinions on this topic <laughs> so Michael thank you for the relevant question. Yes it is a very good question. Um, and so <laughs> thanks to everyone for weighing in. Dana I, I'd like to thank you for joining us and for sharing your interest in the topic and a little bit about how you approach researching something that's around us all the time. Um, it has so many different ways of sort of slicing and dicing what it says both past and present um, and it's been really interesting to hear how you approach it. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to everyone who has given us more things to look into and, and um, wonderful, wonderful comments. Excellent. Now, don't go and anywhere. Questions. We have a few things we'd like to highlight for all of you today and um, uh, a guest who would like to share some uh, special words with all of you. Um, first of all, I wanted to mention that in the exhibit hall, we have um, additional ways to continue your exploration. We also have a special podcast being featured in the Smithsonian uh, uh, the National Museum of American History in their port part of the exhibit hall and it's uh, a way of approaching the question about what are the perceptions versus the reality when it comes to our great state of Hawaii and its history and its cultural um, um, uh, and, and, a, and a cultural approach to looking at Hawaii, and there's a great connection to dress. We'll look at Aloha shirts as well as the music, and it's a really great connection. So I do encourage you to check out the uh, National Museum of American History's exhibit hall, and we'll remind you of that tomorrow as well, so check that out. Um, and while you're at the exhibit hall, check out um, all of the other great resources that cover the topics we explored today. Let me turn the floor over for a moment to Allison Knox, who joins us from our sponsor, Microsoft Partners in Learning, and she'd like to say a few words. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and your questions, your ideas, and your comments, and to the experts for their work and talking and sharing with us the problems that they're solving day to day, and to Learning Times and to Stephanie Norby at Smithsonian and her team for putting this series together. So my name is Allison Knox, and I'm pleased to represent Microsoft U.S. Partners in Learning, and we're the sponsor of um, Smithsonian's 40 <laughs> online conferences. And just a special announcement, in partnership with Smithsonian National Service Learning Clearinghouse in Nuvana, we're also pleased to support the continuation of the conference series by supporting an online and real-world game called Interrobang, which you can register for at playinterrobang.com. The link to Interrobang will also be available through this conference website. Interrobang is a socially networked problem-solving game that provides missions that are completed in the real world. More details and information will soon follow tomorrow during our online conference and upcoming conference. 
thank you again, and I look forward to tomorrow's online conference starting at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks, Allison. And a reminder that all of the sessions today have been recorded, and we'll have those posted for you right up on the program page. The same way you access the live sessions, those recordings can be accessed from the same link. We'll be replacing those with the links to the recording, so you can share them with your friends and colleagues uh, and family members. Um, and I would also like to encourage you to use the discussion area. If you haven't already said a few words about yourself, um, you can do that. But um, each program listing has a link when you click on it uh, to a place where you can post continued uh, questions and comments for each other. Obviously, the uh, the topic here on school uniforms is one that, that uh, has caught the imagination of a lot of people, as well as whether people should be wearing skinny jeans or not. But maybe you can ask some critical questions about those topics in the discussion board, and we'll be in there to continue as well. So thanks again, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, for most of you, it's tomorrow. For some of you, it's later today, depending on where you are. But check the program for times, and we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. And if you're still there, don't forget to click the evaluation link at the top left corner. We'd love your feedback for this final session for today. And we'll see you again for session number four on day two.